lower blood sugar with a low carb diet and it increases adrenal stress. So strictly from the matrix, looking at the matrix, we decided to treat his gut and we already talked about the 5R, but you know, we chose colostrum and a prebiotic, the anti-inflammatory food and the enzyme. And why? Well, here is a depiction of leaky gut and the big molecules shouldn't get absorbed, but you can see that they're able to pass through this leakiness right here. There goes one now. These smaller molecules, because the brush border is injured, they are not being absorbed readily and they should be. So you can see this guy going through the cell, but not as many of them because of the injury to the brush border. Now, remember that things that make the brush border uh, leaky can make the blood brain barrier leaky. So then you can get brain inflammation. We have a beautiful handout for that is patient friendly regarding intestinal permeability in your toolkit. So based on testing, because of his nutritional SNPs and because of his organic acid, right? High potency multivitamin, multimineral with phytonutrients, extra support with activated B vitamins, extra phytonutrients, increases omega-3 fatty acids, support detox of, omega, of, of mercury, uh, and then mast cell stability with uh, things like quercetin. And here is, we've seen this many times in this course already, right? And, and you know, we used to think, well, omega-6 kind of bad, omega-3 good, but both are essential. So we can't be thinking omega-6 bad, we have to think omega balance. So why omega balance? Well, most of us are, have plenty of omega-6 and not as much omega-3 as we should. Increasing the omega-3 is going to make more of a less inflammatory milieu. And then Bob talked extensively, and I think Helen talked extensively, and Kara for that matter, talked extensively. So you had a lot of talk about this um, arachidonic acid cascade. I'm not going to belabor it, bel belabor it anymore, but I just want to call your attention to this and another reason for increasing omega-3s. Now in this patient, uh, he didn't really tolerate the antibiotics, right? So we're gonna focus on the functional medicine treatment. So we're gonna give him the stevia, six weeks on, two weeks off, the um, biocidin, uh, liposomal form of biocidin, two pumps twice a day, Colo also six on, two off, colloidal silver, one ounce twice a day, or once a day, I mean, uh, six on, two off. And then the colostrum is an excellent biofilm inhibitor, but we're going to use that every day because we're also using it for gut support. And remember, we talked about um, biofilms and they're not bad. They're just a way bacteria grow, but we need to make them porous so that our antimicrobials can get in and our immune system can get in. So um, six weeks on and off. Why? Well, we talked about this because of the steady state growth. You get washout over those two weeks. You get um, fewer of the persister forms. The persister forms come out of hiding and then you can hit them again. Um, and this was really kind of first sort of accidentally discovered by uh, Dr. Barascano. And if you read his uh, materials on, on Lyme, you'll see that. Remember that the antimicrobials are just the tip of the iceberg and it's really functional medicine that's doing the lion's share. So it really needs to be about educate, educate, educate. So here we are three months down the line. He started out as my usual patient at a three out of 10. He's now a three or four. So yeah, not really improved, right? But this is the first three months and I already told him he's probably not gonna get better. In fact, he got worse. He got worse in the first month to six weeks, and then he slowly crept back up to baseline. And I told him to expect that. So he's adjusting pretty well to the therapy. His mood is maybe a little stable, more stable, but there's no noticeable change in his physical or cognitive symptoms. And we're going to start to reintroduce foods, um, still low carb, but we're, but we're going to liberalize the um, Renew diet a little bit. So here he comes back at six months. He's now five or six. So he's improved a little bit. He's tolerating treatment. Well, his mood continues to improve. His GI symptoms are about 50% improved. So pretty good improvement. His uh, fatigue, joint, muscle pain, really unchanged. He did notice gluten and dairy being a reactive issue in his gut. So we're going to leave him off of those. His uh, slow progress. He, he It's important to forewarn the patient, like I talked about, 
about the slow progress. So we continue our treatment and he comes back in nine months. Mood continues to improve. It's near baseline actually. His gut is about 75% improved. His cognitive symptoms improving somewhat. He's got less brain fog and he's feeling more competent at work. His joint pain is now maybe 50% better. So now we come to uh, a year. Hmm, still a seven out of 10. He's tolerating the treatment, but everything's about the same as it was. So what's going on? Well, he didn't get that minimum of one improvement. So what are we going to do? Well, it's pretty common. I, and I, like I said, I tell people up front, it's harder to get the last three than the first three. So we talked about it. He's feeling good. So get, what do you do when you feel good? You just fall back into your old habits. He's getting up to, he's staying up later to get work done that he feels like he's been falling behind on. He's not sleeping as much. His stress management has fallen off. His diet has fallen off. He's back to eating on the run and you know, not taking his special food to his lunch meetings. And he's just forgotten to take a whole bunch of his supplements because he feels okay. He doesn't feel great, but he feels better than he has in a long time. So what do we do? Well, I reinforced the idea of giving himself an opportunity for an eight hour sleep. I explained to him that he has stalled and to remember the book he read. I reinforce the need for a stress management and I reinforce and remind him about how um, fight or flight shunts blood away from your gut and all the negative things that happen then. And I reinforce the need for his supplements. And to do that, I actually pulled out his organic acid test and his, SNP, his uh, genetic test, his SNPs. And I showed him that he has a unique need for these things, right? So he, he's in agreement with that. And uh, he comes back at 15 months. He's now an eight or a nine. He's tolerating his treatment. His mood is near baseline. His GI symptoms are nearly resolved. His cognitive and stuff, his brain is about 90% improved. He's near normal at work and maybe even better than, you know, prior to Lyme. <laughs> and his joints uh, are essentially well. So we repeat some labs. We've repeated a bunch of labs in the interim, but just for brevity of this case, um, I'll show you these. So his CD57 uh, is 120. It was less than 20, right? His C4A is 1,050. It was 35,000. So these have normalized very nicely. So we decide, as we used to talk about in the ICU, we're gonna, when we're gonna extubate somebody, right? A trial of life. We gave him a trial of life. We took him off his antimicrobials. So what was this, 15 months or something? I've forgotten. Um, that's a long time to be on these antimicrobial herbs, right? But as the MyLime data shows, longer courses of antimicrobials work better. So he's not on antibiotics, but he is on these antimicrobials. So we stop him. We continue his low carbish, low carbish because he's introduced. You notice that he snuck in and tried to introduce some gluten and found out that it was bad for him. Um, but low carbish, renewish diet um, with reintroductions is tolerated, but still emphasizing low carb. Anti-inflammatory medical food um, and and so on. So, um, and, you know, really discontinued a lot of stuff. So then I have him come back a few times, but here's the 24 month follow-up. He's still a nine plus. He's eight months off of Lyme treatment. He's feeling pretty darn good. He feels better than his pre-Lyme treatment. And his wife comes in at this, says, at this uh, visit and says, this is a new man. This is a new dad. This is a new husband. You know, most patients who get the flu, get the get Lyme, think they had the summer flu and just get over it. Some of them go to the doc and for no obvious evidence-based medicine, they're given antibiotics and fixes it. Then there's the ones who get a little sicker. They're fortunate to get a positive Western blot. They get treated for 14 to 30 days and they get over it. And then there are patients. <laughs> there are our patients. And our patients um, have antecedents. There's something different about them. There's something predisposing them to the susceptibility to getting sick. And it's often detox, immune dysregulation, heavy metal burden, infectious agents, stealth pathology, all of that business. And remember that our genes are not our destiny, but our genes are washed over by our environment. And that can alter function 
into an alarm state that can result in chronic inflammation. And don't forget, we talked about this yesterday, the, the infectious disease conundrum and all of these ways in which antibiotics or sorry, microbes can evade antibiotics and our immune system. And remember that unless there's a compelling reason to do otherwise, we start in the gut. And why do we do that? We do that because the gut is really the seat of the immune system. And then don't forget rebalance, because if you don't focus on rebalance, you're, you're just destined to recirculate and re- um, get into the same problem you started with because it is really your lifestyle that causes these issues. And then reduce the total toxic load. And we talked about that. And don't forget that various triggers and antecedents can cause these feed forward amplification loops, which causes the problem to get larger and the body's ability to resolve it to get smaller. So we have these amplification loops. And don't get lulled into the idea that wellness is a stable position. Wellness lives on this peak and it's easy to slide down this way into increased pathogen dominance or over here into increased immune dominance. And there are likely wormholes that go through because the immune system is not one thing. The immune system is many things and ideally it works in concert. Um, or convert, as that says, it should say concert, but occasionally it works at odds. And you can have Th1 and Th2 and Th17 and Th reg and Th, et cetera, all working at the same time in different locations because the immune system is local, it's regional, it's systemic, and it's all at the same time. And don't forget that antecedents can modulate in multiple areas to wreak havoc and that patients with Lyme disease appear to have multi-system symptoms with unclear origin, but it's often inflammatory in nature. And as I said, this is an example of using the functional medicine model to treat a chronic infection. It happened to be Lyme, but the same ideas apply. And our patients often have uniquenesses they have ATMs, but our ATMs are not our destiny. And infection agents often can modify the local, regional, and systemic immune response and display stealth pathology and remain in the body for weeks, months, and years. So again, it's the entire functional medicine model that takes us where we wanna go. And never fear moving forward slowly. Fear only standing still. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Dr. Salt. So we have now a roundtable discussion on dysbiosis and chronic infections with both Dr. Salt and Dr. Messier. We will start as we often do with a little bit of polling. So the first question is here, what percentage of your patients do you currently use a stool analysis? Dr. Messier obviously talked about that quite a bit. We've been alluding to that uh, quite a bit as well. So we'd like to know. What half it looks like? Yeah. About half. What's the blue and the sometimes maybe? <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the green is, um, uh, most of the time, I think the, the blue is um, uh, never, I believe, although we don't have a key. I believe that's correct. Okay. What's so yellow? majority. What's, what's yellow mean? I think it's sometimes. Sometimes. Well, sometimes. Oh, is it says they're 21% or more, 1% to 5%. So oh, it looks like 36% tested in 21% or more people. Well, that's complicated. I'm assuming that's that is complicated. <laughs> that is complicated. We're going we're gonna to leave too that one. for an early Sunday morning. We're going we're gonna to leave that one because it's too complicated for me to figure out at this point. 
many people do use it. We and and, and as both uh, Helen and Tom, uh, they they uh, use stool analysis as as do I. Not in everyone. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can uh, uh, assume, presume about uh, in, increased intestinal permeability and uh, dysbiosis, but there is a lot that you can get out of a stool analysis as well, particularly, um, you know, what bugs, what protozoa, as Helen talked about in, in her case. And, and also there's some very uh, good um, diagnostic tools about inflammation with uh, calprotectin, for instance. Um, so there's a lot of good information there that when you need it, I would use it. Here's a... Um, uh, case vignette that we'll go through. So a 36-year-old female presents to your office with complaints of chronic loose stools and bloating of three years duration. She presents with the following labs. Uh, elevated HSCRP, a low, low normal uh, in some labs with a serum ferritin, a uh, low, uh, specifically low um, uh, vitamin D, a um, low zinc, and uh, CMV and EBV IgG um, serologies are positive. So you decide to run a stool analysis and you receive the following results. Beneficial bacteria is deficient. Potentially pathogenic bacteria is absent. There are some opportunistic bacteria. You saw some of these in, in some of the labs that uh, Helen presented. Total short chain fatty acids are normal and butyrate is deficient. So um, we're, we're gonna go back and forth here. Uh, what treatment approaches would you start with, Helen? Why don't, why don't you answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. I would almost reverse those questions and start with what other information would I want to know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, in terms of history, so diet history, travel history, birth, you know, was she C-section, just kind of get that uh, breastfed, did she take antibiotics, uh, family history, sort of really all of that. Did she have a bad case of mono, you know, what were the levels of those antibodies? So lots more to kind of fill in that I would want to know. But based on that um, presentation, if we want to start there, definitely looks like she's getting malabsorption. She has um, symptoms that are pretty consistent with potential SIBO as well, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So, you know, uh, if we want to jump into the treatment, so definitely we'll get all of that other information. Um, you know, I'd really, I really have a strong suspicion for SIBO, maybe potentially do a breath test as well. Um, but really start with the diet. So again, start with the basics. Um, and what I find when people have a lot of bloating and a lot of issues, you know, definitely doesn't look like she has any parasites or other, other potential really pathogenic bacteria that are causing a problem. But I often do a trial of a FODMAP diet just to see how they respond. So FODMAP diet is a little different than a elimination diet where, you know, we're not trying to tr take out triggers for a long time so that it antibodies will decrease. We're just trying to see, is that food causing a problem in that individual? And in, in um, SIBO, often, as I was saying, it's not necessarily the amount of bacteria in there. It's just that if you're not able to digest that carbohydrate, uh, say you don't have the brush border enzymes or other things, then even if you don't have a high number of bacteria in your upper intestine, they're going to, if you're not digesting it, it's like a lactase deficiency, right? Then the bacteria are going to start digesting that lactose and that's going to cause bloating because that sensitive upper intestine is, you know, it's very sensitive. It's not meant to handle that kind of bacterial fermentation that's happening there. And so, so, you know, do a trial of FODMAP, see if certain foods and, you know, I, I often break the FODMAP foods into the different types and, and test it that way that have the, the different types of fermentable carbohydrates. And then really, I think I was mentioning it in my talk, focus on the basics, make sure they're eating in a parasympathetic state. The best thing I tell people is get vitamin O. And that comes from Mark David, right? So he wrote a really wonderful book called The Slow Down Diet. Get vitamin O, that's oxygen. Take a deep breath before you eat. 
focus on chewing your food, our whole digestive system doesn't work when we're in a sympathetic state. We need to be in that parasympathetic state. And, and, and little things like just walking after eating so you don't get um, dysmotility. If you just go and you plop down in front of the TV or at your desk after you eat, your digestive system isn't going to move. So that dysmotility can set you up for SIBO. Uh, you know, sometimes doing things like bitters, you know, digestive enzymes can be really helpful, but just basic bitters are really a great way to start with people. Uh, you know, and then, and then the other things that uh, Tom just talked about, you know, colostrum, I like using the SBI protect as well. I think that's really good. Sometimes they need some help with motility more than just walking. Uh, like uh, I bear gas is something I like to use at times. Uh, so things like that. I, I believe that Dr. Messier <laughs> has answered that both those questions <laughs> completely. So the we're only, going the to go on. Add, the only, I just want to say that this apparently was a dollar general uh, CDSA because I would really have been interested in what was the calprotectin, what was yeah. the, um, you know, the enzyme, the exocrine pancreatic function, because that's going to tell Definitely. me a lot more about the brush border. But anyway, I agree. You just nailed that. <laughs> So I just gave you my approach to SIBO. There you go. We're going to go <laughs> on and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Uh, Salt answer the first question here. So, uh, and then we will follow up with Dr. Messier. So uh, a bunch of questions again about dysbiosis. So what labs do you use, Tom, to, to check for dysbiosis and under what circumstances do you do those tests? Um, and what are some specific examples of how this testing can be beneficial and help in your differential diagnosis? And then I'll get to Dr. Messier for that <laughs> last question. So uh, first of all, I want to emphasize that I use Mark One Eyeball and Mark One Ear um, to, to do a lot of this diagnostic stuff. I do not do stool tests on everybody who has gas and bloating. If yeah. somebody has GI symptoms, they have dysbiosis until proven otherwise. And to me, it's an empiric trial. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. An empiric trial is going to be, you know, some kind of diet. It's going to be a FODMAP diet, an elimination diet, a renewed diet, something that we decide on. Um, and it's going to be some, you know, serum derived bovine immune globulins, some egg hyperimmune globulins or colostrum, depending on sensitivities and yada, yada, yada. And um, then depending on the details, it may be probiotics and or prebiotics. But so I don't always, I don't always uh, get uh, stool analysis, but when I do, as the Doseki guy says, um, uh, what do I do? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in all of the markers that probably a lot of people don't look at because we've been older, oversold the idea of knowing which bugs are there. And I'm far more interested in diversity. I'm far more interested in inflammation. I'm far more interested in the health of the brush border. So as an example, um, you know, the uh, pancreatic elastase is a human enzyme that we can measure in the stool. And if pancreatic elastase is low, it's unlikely that you have exocrine pancreatic failure. It's more likely that you've lost cholecystokinin uh, loop, feedback loop. Yep. And that happens because you have injury to your brush border. So, you know, people know about brush border injury and celiac disease, but we see it very commonly in a low elastase. So I'm very interested in that. Um, and then you know, am I interested? And then I'm interested in, do they have um, protozoa? Do they have uh, yeast growth, uh, you know, significant yeast growth? Because yeast doesn't grow that well. And if you see yeast, it's probably real. And then, you know, I have some interest in the fact that, you know, I think I told a story yesterday that, uh, you know, I took a, it was in a brain date. I, I took a stool analysis to the to, this was probably in 1990 or 91. I took a stool analysis to the hospital at lunchtime to show to the GI doc and set it in front of him. And, I, and he looked at it and he had no idea what this thing was, right? And, and, but I, you know, he's a GI doc. He should know all about this, he'd think. And uh, I said, he said, yeah, well, what's this? And I said, well, look, there's no lactobacillus. And he leaned in kind of tight to my ear and he whispers, salt. It's you know, it's shit. What do you expect? 
<laughs> and, and what do I expect? Well, if I biopsy somebody's liver, I expect to see some hepatocytes. If I biopsy somebody's brain, I, I expect to see a few neurons. And if I don't see lactobacillus or E. coli or bifidobacterium on a test, it's a little suspicious, right? So I'm looking at those bigger things more so than the little things. And then what oh, specific- How often do you use uh, secretory IgA? Do you like that one? So it happens to be on the test that I order. I get, I order a test that has calprotectin, secretory IgA. And yeah, I like it. It's good. Yeah. It's just not as stable. So, you know, I think it can be falsely low because it can break down if it's transported, you know, slowly. Mm -hmm. But I do like it. Um, and so I like that. And I like it in particular because, you know, secretory IgA is the major antibody in the mucosa. So it's nice to know if it's adequate. And if it's low, it's bad. And if it's high, it's bad. So, you know. So just, just for all of you, the, the words that sometimes Dr. Salt uses, we're, we're taking that out of the uh, recording <laughs> that you'll get later. So you heard it once, but we're denying it. <laughs> so with that, why don't we have- I should have, have said excrement. <laughs> excrement, yes. It wouldn't be as good a story if you, if you said that. <laughs> so I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so how about, Helen, what lab test do you use to check for intestinal permeability, either directly or indirectly? Yeah, I mean, I think the same way Tom said, you know, it's dysbiosis until proven otherwise, I think the same applies to intestinal permeability. Really, it's intestinal permeability until proven otherwise. If you see inflammation in someone anywhere, uh, it, think intestinal permeability, and you have to prove to me that it doesn't exist first. And, and just, I think you said it yesterday, Dan, but just to remind everybody, intestinal permeability or leaky gut is not an all or none thing. It happens, it can happen transiently. You know, we see that when people take NSAIDs, it knocks out their intestinal permeability for a while, but you know, our gut regenerates very quickly, our gut lining. And so it's going to repair itself. And so it's always looking at that balance of what's causing it to be, uh, to damage those tight junctions and how quickly are they repairing. So you're looking at the balance between damage and repair. So it's really, think of it as a continuum. You know, are they more like, do they have, are they on that side of more leakiness or less leakiness? So that's kind of how you have to look at it. And, and that's why there's no really great test because it's, you know, at what point in time are you capturing this in this very dynamic situation? Uh, but, you know, some of the tests that you can use are things like the lactulose mannitol test uh, where, you know, one of them's a very big sugar, one of them's a small sugar, you, the person drinks it and the mannitol. So I always remember it, M is more. So mannitol should be uh, absorbed more and lacto lactulose less because it's bigger. And if you see, uh, so if, it, if a lot of mannitol, less lactulose goes in, you, you know that that's working well. If the lactulose starts to go up when you look at that ratio, then it must probably going trans um, paracellular. And, and there might be more leakiness. Sometimes I look at um, things like zonulin antibodies that because we know zonulin can break down the lining of the gut. So testing zonulin itself, zonulin is very variable. And so uh, testing the antibodies is a little bit better way to capture that. And then, um, you know, IgG food sensitivities. If you see a ton of IgG food sensitivities, then, I mean, that's a really great pointer that they have quite significant leaky gut. And then there's some tests you can do uh, looking at that brush border, like you said, Tom. Um, so diamine oxidase, which is made on that brush, brush border, there's some blood tests that will look for levels of DAO. So that can be helpful too, to see how much damage is happening at that gut lining. That's good. You know, Helen. The other issue that I think people get confused about is, oh, they have leaky gut. But the real question is, well, what's driving the leaky gut? Leaky mm -hmm. gut isn't really the final process. So there's, yeah. you know, there's inflammation there. There's something driving that leaky gut. And, yeah. and it goes back to that rebalance step. If you don't think about what's driving the leaky gut, you're going to give them a whole bunch of stuff. They're going to feel better. And when they stop all the stuff, they're not going to feel good anymore. We don't want people that are stuff dependent. We want people who can thrive on a normal yeah. diet and lifestyle. That's a really good point. I think the same thing applies to SIBO as well, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we always talk about 
SIBO treatment failure or leaky gut treatment failure, because you're right, if you don't address why it happened in the first place, you know, we might, and that's the whole idea of root cause medicine, where do you actually stop at that root? <laughs> you know, is the leaky gut the root cause? Or, you know, what else? Is it the stress in their lifestyle that's the, the root cause? Or is it, you know, so you can keep going down and you really have to, and it, it's, it's the whole thing, you, have, you can't lose sight of the big picture. Yeah, I think those are great points by both of you. The one that I'll add is, uh, Helen, you talked about autoimmune disease and, uh, you know, it's presumptive, I think, if you have an autoimmune disease, that you, presumptively you have increased intestinal permeability, or at least you had. Absolutely, Absolutely. yeah. Um, so let's go to another poll. And that is hopefully it won't be quite as <laughs> complicated. What dietary intervention is specific for promoting short chain fatty acid production? Oh, good. Prebiotics, butyrate, cellulose. And you can answer, I believe, more than one on these. Maybe not. No one's so I think that cellulose. That's, that's good. That I'm, I'm glad. Well, now I see a little bit of cellulose. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Messier actually had a, um, a a poll in terms of, you know, soluble versus insoluble fiber. And cellulose is an insoluble fiber. So there would be very little to no short chain fatty acid production with cellulose. But with uh, prebiotics, certainly uh, those are at some level, uh, a subset of soluble fibers and butyrate, um, you can uh, uh, um, uh, promote, uh, butyrate is obviously a short chain fatty acid. So it, it uh, promotes um, short chain fatty acid production as well. So I think both of those are, are correct. So we'll have, uh, for this one, let's just have Helen, why don't you just answer these two questions. Um, first, see if Tom maybe has anything to add, but I think you're going to be fairly complete in knowing <laughs> you. What specific dietary and or supplemental interventions do you use to improve dysbiosis and increase microbial diversity? And what are your recommendations for prebiotics and fiber, especially those on a low fiber diet? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, Tom, you just went over some great ones, you know, start with uh, that weed, seed and feed that I went over. And, and really, if we want to create diversity, we have to feed diversity as well. So, you know, if you feed, the, if you eat the same food every single day, you're not going to get that diversity in your microbiome. So the idea is variety. If you want diversity in microbiome, you have to feed diversity. So that starts with lots of different fruits and vegetables with their fibers, but you can also use fibers um, in supplemental form. And in that case, I also use lots of different fibers. So, you know, looking at the, like the flax and the inulin and the fructooligosaccharides and the apple pectins and, you know, sometimes um, hydrolyzed guar gum is a nice one uh, that can often not exacerbate SIBO. So if you really want to get the fiber in there, uh, that's a nice one to use. Um, and so really, you know, diversity is the key to, you know, social order and also microbiome order. It's really, really, I think, uh, critical. And, and so that's what I would start with to increase that diversity. Um, you know, and, and again, often when you do that, when you increase that diversity, you don't have to kill the bad guys necessarily, right? If there's just, if you, if you allow those good guys to grow and feed them, uh, you're going to, you're going to get that um, diversity and they'll outcompete the bad guys and you don't have to go in there and kill things. And, and then I mentioned it in my talk as well, but fasting is really important for increasing microbial diversity. And I think people forget about this because we have different kinds of organisms. So we have those organisms that, that thrive in a calorie rich environment. And, you know, when you're eating, they're going to, and you eat all the fibers, they're going to really grow. 
but they're the guys that don't thrive in that calorie rich environment. They're going to be static and stay and stay in a little bit of stasis during that time. And then when you fast, the opposite happens. So now you've got those organisms like Acromantia, mucinophila, which is really important organism we know it, uh, for diabetes. There's a probiotic of Acromantia that actually has been shown to treat diabetes. Uh, so that actually lives off the mucus lining. And when there's no other food source available, the other bacteria kind of sit back and, and allows these, these mucus feeders and the guys that grow in that calorie poor environment to grow. So that's what increases the overall diversity of the microbiome. So, so fasting is, is important, you know, the mitophagy, autophagy, all of those things, but really important for uh, microbial diversity as well. Um, and, you know, our microbes have a circadian rhythm. That's something we don't, you know, and they can direct our circadian rhythm too. So it's important to work in conjunction with that. I think I answered, oh, the low fiber ones. Yeah, I, you mentioned the paleo keto. I, I think if you do a keto paleo diet right, you still should get lots of fiber in your diet. You know, um, that's, I, I worry, I did a study on people on a ketogenic diet where we actually measured their microbiome every single day. We put them on a very solid ketogenic diet um, without a lot of, you know, low carb uh, vegetables and um, their microbiome changed very quickly. Um, first of all, they became very constipated and we didn't get a daily sample for everybody, but we started to see a lot more inflammatory organisms. So I think for people that are doing a keto paleo style diet, you have to really ensure that you're not messing up your microbiome when you're doing that and, and make sure I, fiber doesn't cause uh, there's that's non-digestible carbs. They're not going, you know, they're not going to contribute to carb intake when you take fiber in, in the keto diet. So I think that's really important. If you're not getting it in your vegetables and you should add it in as a supplement. I think that's uh, very complete. And I just think <laughs> that the uh, uh, comments you made about fasting and the microbiome counterintuitive, but I think so important. So we're gonna let uh, Dr. Salt answer this question. Patients with Lyme disease have symptoms that can vary widely. Given that, when would you make the determination to test for Lyme? What is the best initial testing that you, rec you recommend? Well, so um, Lyme disease is weird, right? It's been called the great imitator. We used to have this, the great imitator was syphilis. And there were books that were, you know, very thick and heavy that were written about everything that syphilis could do. Well, syphilis is a spirochete just like Lyme is. And it turns out it, it has nearly every symptom under the sun, right? But the, the, the main issues are uh, reasonable expectation of exposure. Um, so that's number one. Number two is roving, moving joint and muscle pain, and then unrelenting progressive fatigue and these joint pains over time. So if you see that picture, um, you need to look for things that can cause that. And there aren't that many things that can cause the roving joint and muscle pain. So when I see that picture, that's when I really start to get my ears perk up about, about Lyme disease. You know, there are, there are um, people who don't have those symptoms and end up having Lyme disease too. So I go back to that idea of reasonable expectation of exposure. And then um, what, you know, so how, what else? Well, somebody comes in and they have weird symptoms and we work those weird symptoms up one side and down the other and we can't find a reason for it. So, you know, they came in from their neurologist and their neurologist told them they have atypical MS. And we look at their, um, you know, their MRIs of their brain and spine, and they don't really have much in the way of, of lesions compared to the symptomology, right? So, or they, or they have, you know, just something strange about what's going on. And so you need to look harder. And that's when I'm going to look at Lyme. And in terms of the best test, well, define best is the hard part, but um, uh, I'm going to 
they probably, if they haven't already had a Western blot, they may have had the two-tiered test that got stopped at the level of the EIA or IFA. And if they, if that happened, I'm going to do the Western blot anyway, because it's going to be covered by most insurance. If it's not covered by insurance, you know, it's so hard to know what is and what isn't covered by insurance these days, but I'm going to try to do something that's covered by insurance. But if I have a high index of suspicion, I'm probably going to use the Vibrant Laboratory Tick-Borne panel. They have two panels, 1.0 and 2.0. The only difference is the 2.0 goes deeper into uh, imitators and the like. So, you know, the 1.0 used to be the most comprehensive test on the market. Now the 2.0, they've outdone themselves. Um, so I'm going to do one of those two tests. And the reason I do that is because, as I showed in my talk yesterday, it's not just Borrelia burgdorferi anymore, right? There are some six or seven species that can cause Lyme-like symptoms. There are several species that can cause tick-borne relapsing fever. There are other um, considerations with uh, other symptoms in, in Lyme. And there are co-infections. And then there are things that aren't really tick-borne illness, but imitate it, like even pandas as, as an example, or um, various viral eruptions, the endogenous virus eruptions and so on. So that's the test I'm likely going to get. And I, I wonder if I answered the question. You did, you I answered think both you of did. them. <laughs> that was, yeah. that was excellent. Gee, just, I, I really like that vibrant Lyme test as well, the tick-borne um, panel. I think that's a very, I, I've been really happy with it when they came out with that. Um, how do you like that compared to the Igenix one, Tom? Uh, what I like about it is I feel like um, the Igenix is still a blot methodology, right? So you have proteins migrating through a gel. And, and to me, the question kind of becomes, um, you know, is the gel made precisely the same? Are there, are there different migration patterns? You know, my uh, LED lights in my house are, are dimming. It. They're doing this all the time, dimming up and down. So what's, how, much, how much control over the current they're applying do they really have? Yada, yada. You know, there's a lot of pieces Variability. of that puzzle. Mm -hmm. And so instead, what Vibrant has done is they've isolated. We know what these proteins are. There's really no reason for a blot technique anymore. So they've isolated these these and connected them to a, um, a chip and they're using coloremic, um, basically, mm -hmm. basically like an ELISA sort of yeah. uh, assay. And it's, it's orders of magnitude more sensitive and more precise. Are they, manuf I know in their other testing, they're manufacturing the peptides right on the chip um, for right. say their wheat zoomer. Is that what they're doing with the, with the tick-borne one as well? Yes, yeah. obviously not yeah. the PCR I, fraction of it, right. but yeah, the, yeah. the serology fraction is. Yeah, they manufacture it directly on the chip. So they, they synthesize the peptides directly, which right. um, gives you a lot of control. Uh, you have to make sure the epitopes form properly uh, when you do right. that. But so I think that's uh, definitely the linear epitopes will work really well. Exactly. Sorry. So uh, <laughs> I was a, a bit too optimistic about how many questions we Sorry. would get through, <laughs> um, which is uh, unlike me, I'm not a very optimistic person. Uh, so we're gonna uh, go through these and we're just gonna come to the end here. Um, which is, we do have um, our last uh, break, this morning break, uh, last time to visit uh, exhibitors, live at least, and um, both uh, Dr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Roundtree will be in the IFM Resource Center. Same thing we did with uh, uh, Dr. Messier and Dr. Salt yesterday. They will be answering specific questions on specific topics. We encourage you to come into that resource center. Um, we will uh, herd you to one or the other uh, presentations or one or the other Q&A, whichever one you want to go into, obviously. And we will uh, come back in 30 minutes for more case management discussions, a Q&A with all four of our educators and a wrap up. So thanks, Tom. Thanks, Helen. We'll see you all in 30 minutes. Awesome.
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So, all right. Uh, let me see what I'm doing here. Hold on. I got to stop this thing. <laughs>